happen again. We're a couple weeks into the new year, and we started the new year with the concept of newness, newness of life. And I want to remind you of from that very first teaching time that we spent together, those four magnificent verses that ensure us a victory that remind us that it is God that is helping us out and that whatever it is that we faced last year that kept tripping us up, this year, we don't have to be that person. Let's look at those four verses. Philippians 1.6, I'm confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God's working in you. It's his strength. He's perfecting you. And that work continues not just until this Sabbath, but till when? Jesus returns. So friends, don't be dismayed. If you're not that man or that woman you want to be yet, Paul tells his church at that time, almost 2,000 years ago, God's going to be working with you every breath of your life. Don't you worry about it. You stay close to God. The second one, Philippians 2.13, it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Who is it that reminds you of what right looks like? Who is it that taps you on that little mental shoulder and says, hey, there's a different way to do this. That's not the right way. There's a better way over here. Paul to the church at Philippi reminds us, it's God that does that for you. He's the one willing. He's giving you these concepts of what right looks like, and he's also the one working in you. So again, you stay close to him. You'll become that man or woman that you want to be. Like Jesus. The third one, Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, I love that first line. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. How many of you tripped up last year? We don't need a show of hands. I did all over the place. I wasn't the person I wanted to be last year many different times, but here is a text, the third of four, that says there is one that can keep us from stumbling this year. These are promises to give you courage and hope. The fourth one, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and 14. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it Therefore, my beloved, what? Flee from idolatry. What is your part in every temptation? Track shoes and run. Friends, the difference between what Paul is telling and what I do so often is he uses the word flee. We just scramble the letters and we feel. Right? What gets us in trouble is the fact that we're always feeling temptation. But he says, no, that's the wrong spelling. Flee temptation. These four verses, I want you to start this year. Remind yourself, because this is how we overcome. This is how we become more like Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Now, this Sabbath, I want to add something. Because it's one thing to just know these things, but there's something that is there in Scripture that reminds us there's another piece to this puzzle. To become that new man or that new woman, there's something additional we can do. So we're going to come at this through an illustration in Scripture and through something familiar to us if we've been Adventists for some time. There is a temptation that is coming to all of the world, and it lies between our day and the return of Jesus. Now, you know, as we're going to read some texts that are very familiar to you, if you've been in this community of faith for any time, you know that that final temptation is a temptation to worship anything or anyone else except for God. And that is coming on the entire world. It's the last temptation before Jesus returns. And there is something that I saw in Scripture as I was preparing for this that was a little cautionary note to me. And I know it'll be a cautionary note to you. Because sometimes we think, hey, I know what this temptation is. I'm ready for it. But let's explore today and see if that's the case. So worship option number one between our day and the return of Jesus occurs in Revelation chapter 13, a prophetic chapter as Jesus is revealing to John the events of what transpired between John's day and Jesus' return. Revelation 13, 11, if you're joining, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and you know, we know from the book of Daniel that a beast is simply a mascot for what? It's, it's a mascot for a nation or a kingdom, right? Now, that's the general box, 
Anytime you see a beast in prophecy, just think nation. If you're from Tampa, you know, or this area, you know that the Tampa Bay area has several different things that represent it in the sports field, right? If it's the hockey corner of the universe, it's the Tampa Bay Lightning. Lightning is a symbol for that team, right? If it's the football corner of the universe, Tampa Bay what? Buccaneers. It's a symbol for that team. In Scripture, beasts are symbols or mascots. If we're putting it in today's language. For nations or kingdoms. So just to remind you of that. So when John sees another beast coming up out of the earth, he's watching a nation rise to power. That's what Jesus is revealing. He had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast. There's another nation or power that had come up long before that in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Let's pause there for a second. That's between us and the return of Jesus. If a prophet or a person or an angel shows up and calls down fire from heaven, what do you think the influence would be among the Christian world? What do you think the influence would be among the non-Christian world who already believes often in signs and wonders? It is a powerful temptation. It is a powerful delusion. Because the Bible is already telling us that this individual is not representing God when this is happening. Revelation 14, 15. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not... What's that word again? Worship. This is the temptation that's coming. Something's going to happen on planet Earth between this Sabbath and Jesus' return. And men are going to be asked to worship a certain way. He causes all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one might buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Friends, this could be a prophecy seminar, but we're not going into it from that direction. This is a text I'm, I'm using as we begin our time together to remind you the issue that's coming up on the whole earth that's just in front of us is one of worship. And here is a nation or nations telling the world to worship a specific way and it is not worshiping God. Worship option number two is a chapter later, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14, 6, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel, the good news of Jesus to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And you know prophetically, if you have spent any time in the book of Daniel at all, that that hour of judgment that has come is when Christ moved from the holy place to the most holy place in 1844. These are things you can explore outside of today in our time together, and if you're curious about them, talk to me, and I'll help you with those. But the issue, the temptation coming is either worship the beast, worship the way the government or the nations tell you, or worship the creator. Okay. Now, this is an old, old thing that Satan wants. Satan is a fallen angel. He's created being. He was created by God, but he wants worship. How do we know this? Look at Matthew chapter 4, 8 and 9. One of the three temptations when he took Jesus and was trying to get him to cave in at the beginning of his ministry was this very thing. Starting with Matthew 4, 8, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said to him, all these things I will give you if you will what? Fall down and worship me. Now, what was Jesus' response? It is written, what? Worship The Lord your God, and him only shalt thou serve. Friends, the issue at hand, and that which has always been, is a rebellious angel wanting our worship and the worship that alone belongs to God. Okay, and we think we're ready for this. 
Our denomination has been talking about this for almost 180 years now, 178 years we've been preaching and teaching from Daniel and Revelation to worship God the way he asked to be on the covenantal day, which is Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. So when we hear this, these prophetic words from the book of Revelation, many of us have heard that our entire life and we're thinking, hey, I'm ready for this. I got this. When that happens, I know where I'll be. I'll be on the good guy's side. I'll be on Jesus' side. I'll be right next to him. I'll be loyal and true, and I'll show him my love. And this is where I want to come into today's time together. Because there was an event that happened much like that with some people very much like us, and it didn't turn out very much like they thought. Let's go into this. Matthew 26. It's just after the Lord's Supper. The disciples have been with Jesus for three and a half years. And they are unwittingly entering the last few hours of his life before that Friday crucifixion. It says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is Matthew 26, 30. Then Jesus said to them, all of you, nobody's left out, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written. You see how much emphasis Jesus places on trusting the word of God. It is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, and you got to love Peter. You remember Peter, right? Sword packing, brave, strong, burly fisher dude. He is loyal. He is ready to lay down his life for Jesus. Peter answered and said to him, even if all of them, I'm inserting two words, are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, assuredly I say to you this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die for you, you got to love Peter's heart, right? Man, he, his heart's in the right place. Even if I have to die for you, I will not deny you. And so said, how many? All the disciples. They are ready to stick with their Lord through thick and thin. They're ready to lay down their lives, or so they think. And so the phrase is, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Could it be that we think similar things as we approach that prophetic moment in time when all the world is called to worship the beast? Could we be like the disciples? Because here's what happens next. Matthew 26, 36, Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and he said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. He took with him, notice carefully who he's taking, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. He takes with him the very one that led out in saying, not me, Lord, I got this. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and he fell on his face and he prayed saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but what? As you will. What a way to pray. Then he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, and you can hear him talking to Peter gently because both he and Peter remember what Peter said. What? Could you not watch? Just watch. This isn't even laying down your life, Peter. Couldn't you just watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed saying, Oh, my father. If this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. He came and found them asleep again. Their eyes were heavy. You ever been there? Late at night, long week, overworked at the university or the school, or your job or the hospital, and oh, forget it. You want to stay awake, but you're asleep in that easy chair or the couch or wherever you happen to just sit and think you were going to get right back up. No. Their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away again and he prayed the third time saying the exact same words. Then he came to his disciples. He said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, 
The hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So here comes the crowd to take Jesus. Jesus has to wake these earnest disciples and say, look, here they come. Okay, so what happens next? Do they stay loyal and true? Are they going to stay with him in the moment that he's captured? Are they going to follow through what they were so certain of? We'll be loyal. We'll stay with you. Even if you have to die, we'll die right next to you. Is that what happens? Matthew 26, 56. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. But friends, they were so sure that they were going to be loyal. They were convinced in their heart of hearts that if something happened to their master, they were going to stay right there with him. So what on earth happened? How do you go from being utterly convinced that you know yourself and you're going to be loyal and true and the next second you are running for the hills, but not because God told you? I want to propose four things. First of all, their proximity made them powerless. When I say their proximity, the question should be what? What were they near to? What did they, they stay close to that made them powerless? And I'll say the world. You remember that Peter's still packing that sword, and what he does before he takes off and flees is chop off somebody's ear. And the Lord has to tell him, put away the sword. Don't do that. That's not how we do this, Peter. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit. Peter, who later turns around and wherever, however far he ran before he was out of breath and couldn't fall anymore and finds his way back through tears, somewhere in there Peter does return, but then Peter's denying him beside the fire three times. Friends, when we stay near the world and Peter's sitting there denying him with cursing and swearing just to prove his point, I'm not one of those goody two-shoe disciples. No, listen to, listen to the way I talk. No, I'm one, of the, I'm one of the other guys. When we stay near the world, there is no way that we can say like our master did. The prince of this world comes, but he has nothing in me. Friends, because of our unwillingness to let go of the things the Holy Spirit shows to us, the enemy sometimes has an arsenal of things in us, in us, to draw us away from the one we love. Our only safety is in fleeing what's in us, giving it to God so that we're not near to anything and we're not powerless. Second, I would propose that their nearness made them negligent. They had spent three and a half years walking and working with the Son of God himself. Isn't it in our own culture true that there is a saying that says familiarity breeds contempt? You can get lax doing what you do when you do it every day. You can get a little careless. And I want to propose that they spent so much time with God that they hadn't developed a relationship with God. They spent so much time watching him work and watching him be and do that they neglected what they were supposed to become. Third, that their record made them reckless. What was it that Jesus had sent them out to do on some of their first missions? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Oh, they got this, right? Hey, whatever's coming, ah, we got it. We've raised the dead back to life. We've cast out demons. We've restored sight to the blind. The ability to move to the lame, hearing to those who can't hear. And when you deal with that level of power, sometimes... Again, you can neglect the very things that you need, the very things that are necessary to succeed in the moment of temptation. Do you remember, too, if we're talking about the sleeping aspect that night, hadn't they slept at different times? Hadn't Jesus always solved the problems even when they were sleeping? Yeah, they could wake up and all the people were healed. They didn't have to do it. They didn't have to feed people. Jesus would feed people. They didn't have to work because Jesus always picked up the pieces. So again, on this night in that garden, maybe Jesus is just going to fix it all. They can sleep. 
And finally, perhaps their focus made them fearful. In that moment, when Jesus wakes them up and they see a mob with torches and weapons approaching to take them, their eyes are not on Jesus. Their eyes are on what's coming, not on the one who has already come. Jesus, the center and their source of power. Jesus, the, the one who can preserve and save them, who spoke to a storm and said, peace be still. And the sea calmed. Their focus is not there. Their focus is on the mob and what's going to happen. What happens when those soldiers get here? What happens when that rabble and those people get here? They look violent. They sound violent. And we know they're coming for him. And their fear takes over. So could it be that our proximity would make us powerless? Friends, we have been in the word of God as a denomination for almost 180 years, preaching and teaching truth as we know it, the truth as it's revealed to us. Is there any possibility that we could be so much into that that we have forgotten the same thing the disciples forgot? That our source of power is not ourselves? Could it be that our nearness would make us negligent? We spend all the time near and in the word, near and in God's ministry, near and in God's work. But what if we're so busy doing that we forgot this is about being? That we spend so much time doing good things that we forgot the great thing that we're supposed to be doing, which is partnering with Christ to learn how to flee from sin. Could it be that our record would make us reckless when we have the second largest uh, educational system in the world for a denomination? When we have a health system, a health care system of hospitals and universities related to the medical sciences, could it be that that record of being and doing and being known for success would make us careless? That we, like the disciples, could be thinking, I got this. When that moment comes and I have to choose between worshiping God the way he asked me to or worshiping anything else, I'm on God's side. Could it be that we're just like the disciples? And could it be that our focus would make us fearful? Friends, as we approach the end of all things in Revelation 13, 14, between there and Revelation 19 where Jesus returns, what if our focus is so much on the scary stuff that we're forgetting to keep our eyes on the God who calms storms. Could it be that our focus is like the disciples, that we're, we're spending so much time focusing on the scary parts of prophecy that we forget the God who gives prophecy, the Lord who loves, the one who, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and the what? The Prince of Peace. Could it be that we would make the same mistake the disciples did? Now, Paul, when he's speaking to his little church at Corinth, he, he is using examples from the Old Testament, and he says this to his congregation, and I'll say it to you today. All these things that happened to them, they're examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Friends, it is so tempting sometimes because of our nearness to God or the fact that we have a, a messenger from God or the fact that we're doing the work of God to think that we're ready for what comes next. And I am reminded from Scripture that we might not be as ready as we think. Because here is the key to the whole matter. Jesus saw the disciples falling asleep. And he gave them the key to their success if they would take it and use it. He said, watch and pray. Lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the what? The flesh is weak. He knew where their hearts were at. When they said, look, if you die, we'll die with you. And even if they fall, not me. Jesus, I got you. He knew their hearts were in the right place, but he also knew that the flesh is weak. So he says, watch and pray. Watch. What is watch? Well, you know, uh, you are familiar with the old term, a watchman, right? The person who stands and stays awake at night and watches the city to keep us from harm. The person who in their day would have marched around the city wall 
observant to see if anything is coming that might cause harm. So Jesus, when he's saying watch, he's saying be, be as awake and as aware as someone who is expecting harm to come and who knows that the defense of those behind you rests on you. Watch, he says, and the second part, pray. Because prayer acknowledges several things. Prayer acknowledges that I'm willing, oh man, but I'm weak. Prayer is that reaching out for a power greater than our own. It reaches out to our Heavenly Father and says, Dad, I can't do this. It acknowledges the fact that we're sinful beings with sinful desires. And the prince of this world, when he comes, as we've already said, finds an arsenal within us to use against us. So prayer, first of all, says, I am willing, but Dad, I'm weak. Second of all, prayer says, I am hopeless, but God is helpful. It acknowledges that you have a heavenly father that just loves to hear you pray to him. Dad, I'm in trouble. Could you help me out? Father, I'm not in trouble. I just want to talk to you today, and I, I just want to ask you for this or that, or I just want to say thank you. So often, our heavenly father can't wait to hear us say, I'm hopeless, but you're helpful. Right? How many of you, I don't know when you were kids, um, I love to do things on my own. But I'll tell you what, there are some things that I wasn't quite as uh, good at as I thought. So riding the bicycle for the first time, and when, when you are on a hill like we lived on, it is a hill probably like this. It seems to be like about 45 or 50 degrees that comes up to our house. And uh, it wasn't dirt, and it wasn't paved, it was gravel. So when you say, I got this bicycle thing, don't help me, Dad. Don't hold the back. Don't hold the back, Mom. I'm going for it. I'll tell you what. Betadine and Band-Aids come next. Right? Because you don't got it. Your heart's in the right place, but your flesh does not have that balance down yet. Dad loves to help us out with things. I'm hopeless, Dad, but you're helpful, so I'm here talking with you. Prayer acknowledges that I'm powerless, but God is powerful. Friends, we, we are up against an adversary older than us, wiser than us, who the New Testament describes as a roaring lion circling, seeking whom he can devour. So we need somebody stronger than us and stronger than our enemy, and that's our powerful Heavenly Father. The moment that you pause to pray, and this is what Jesus was telling those disciples, pause, disciples, pray, pray. Don't think you got this. Don't just keep going. Admit, I'm powerless, but God is powerful. And finally, prayer acknowledges I'm vulnerable, but God is victorious. Amen. God wins every single time, hands down, when we say, tell you what, Dad, you take the test for me. You show me the way and I'll go. When I was a kid in uh, junior high school, I took a Spanish class. Spanish was tough. Still is. You pick a foreign language up, um, my hat's off to you. I'm still learning. But I'll tell you what. I had some cousins who spoke fluent Spanish. Their father was from Mexico. They were raised speaking both languages. They were bilingual. I was like a little kid who couldn't find his way out of a box. And I'll tell you what. I would have given anything during my Spanish tests to have been able to call up a friend. Boop, 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 boop. Hey, Javier. What's the answer to number four? But that is exactly what God wants you to do every time you have a test. God on speed dial. Dad, this is what's happening to me. Now, I know what I want to do, but that's usually the wrong answer. Dad, what do you want me to do? I want to do that one. You take this test for me. That's how he wants us to face every single temptation that comes to us, especially the one that is coming on all the earth that Daniel heard from God, passed forward. John heard from God, passed forward. That test is coming, friends, without prayer, without that pause for prayer, we're not ready for like we thought. We sit in the pews, we read the great controversy, we read scripture, we pray, but sometimes we forget to say, Dad, I'm not ready. This moment, this day, I don't got it. But we need to get it. What are some next steps in 2022? 
We started with those four reminders how it is God that gives you the strength to overcome every time. He provides a way of escape for every temptation. But we're reminded from what happened to the apostles that we need prayer to accompany what we already know. We need help, divine help. So first of all, next step in 2022, could we acknowledge that indeed the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak? Could we transition from I've got this, dad, to I don't got this? You've got this. In every temptation this year, could I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to reach out for dad's help first. Father, what do I do? Pause and ask for help. Second of all, could we watch to win? Could could we pray? Father, help me to observe the times I'm living in Help me to observe this moment the way you see it. Because so often those little tiny things that come up and tempt us, we still think, I got it. It's easy. It's small. It's not small. It's never small. And we always need the help that God offers. Could we ask, help me watch. Let me determine to watch. Third, could we pause to pray in order to prevail? Now, what does this mean in the New Testament? It means to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Just like you, I don't think too many of you have been sitting here counting your breath, the number of breaths you've taken since we started this service. Our time together, not one of us is, I'm on 5,286, Pastor, 500,287, Pastor. We don't do that because breathing is natural for us. And what I'm suggesting from what I read in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is that prayer should be as natural as breathing. Just as a heartbeat, just as your lungs go in and out and give you life every moment of every day. We should be talking to dad just like that. He loves to hear us talk to him. You don't have to kneel. You can pray as you drive. You don't have to close your eyes. You can just be talking to him in your head and he loves to hear it. Pray without ceasing, Paul tells the church at Thessalonica. Pray for forgiveness, 1 John 1, 9. Make sure that our, we know for certain that our lives are right with God before we come up to a moment of temptation. Because here's what happens sometimes. You come up to that moment of temptation, and you're like, okay, here I am. I know what to do. And the enemy's like, ah, nope. Remember, you tripped up last week on this one. And you're like, oh, you're right, I did. Okay, never mind. Instead of knowing that the king of the universe has already forgiven you. Yeah, you're right, Satan. I did trip up on that last week. And then I went to dad and I apologized for it. I owned it. I asked him for forgiveness of it. And he said, you and I can partner and you don't ever have to do that again. Make sure that we take God up on those promises. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's everything from the time you first toddled along and stole that cookie from your brother or sister to the present moment, all in righteousness. Praying, pausing to pray. We pray for wisdom in James 1, 5 to the God who says, I'll give it to you liberally and I'm not even getting on your, I'm not going to get on your case about it. Now that is not the new King James or the King James. I'm paraphrasing, right? But he gives liberally without up He's not he's not reprimanding you for asking. He can't wait to back up that dump truck load of wisdom when you ask for a teaspoon and say, I got you. Pray for wisdom. Pray to be kept from stumbling. Claim those promises. Jude 24. Now him to his able to keep me from stumbling. Pray to see the way of escape and to flee temptation. First Corinthians 10, 13 and 14. Again, The enemy just scrambles the word. We saw that, right? He encourages to feel the temptation when what God is saying is flee the temptation. Same four letters, totally different meaning, life or death. Flee temptation, pray for that. And finally, Philippians 4.13. What a place to finish today, friends, because Philippians 4.13, if you look at that, says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me or who gives me strength. Friends, as we head deeper into 2022, as as we know that the world goes more chaotic and we head toward Revelation 13, 14 events where the nations of the world say, hey, we want you to worship this way. We need to learn that cautionary table where a bunch of disciples 
who were so familiar and so powerful and so near Christ that they failed at the end. We need to learn from that. But I encourage you this year, know the promises. Remember to pause to pray, and you will every single time prevail this year.